Well, here we are again, Hornets, and this time we are getting into another Ready Workbook lesson. And for this one, we're going to be on page 145. So for any reason you don't have your workbook out already, you can go ahead and pause the video, get your workbook out so we can get started. And the very first thing that we're going to be doing is we are looking at analyzing the structure of a poem. Now, if we remember correctly, so let's go ahead and box our title, Analyzing the Structure of a Poem. We remember from our last couple of things that we've been dealing with with poetry. So we're going to just continue with that. But before we do that, let's go ahead and break our title down. And speaking of that, analyzing. Well, when we say analyzing, we are look, let's rewrite our title at the top. Analyzing the Structure of a Poem. And we're doing that to reinforce, guys, what we are doing through this lesson. So that way, when we finish it, y'all will have uh, a deeper understanding and won't forget all of the little steps that we're about to go through. So underneath analyzing, we're going to write down what that means. And it means to break apart or to break down. And when we say structure, we want to know how it's built. And when I want to know how it's built, I want to know if it's going to be a free verse poem, which means that it is going to be an arrangement of lines that is irregular and there may be no rhyme scheme, which is that pattern of rhyme that we use for poetry, okay? So, and we've been practicing with rhyme scheme a lot with our, you know, with the last word of each line in a poem and trying to see if it has a pattern built in, if it's got that repetition that we look for in poetry. The other thing we want to make sure we're looking at when I'm talking about poems is that remembering what, how poems are also structured and built, and that is with lines and stanzas, okay? So, and right here in our workbook, we've got that, that poets arrange their thoughts in stanzas, which are groups of lines, and I'm going to come over here and draw an arrow that is the kind of closest thing I can get to that is like a paragraph. When we're reading stories, when we're reading prose, that a stanza is similar to a paragraph in our stories that we've been reading. So it also, we just mentioned that it's also got lines. So we can't forget that when we're numbering poetry, we always want to make sure we pay attention to what lines things are in. Okay. Now, just to go back to the top, we are going to be working with the Mississippi Common, I mean, Co College and Career Readiness Standard for Reading Literature, 7th grade number 5, and it's analyzing how a poem's form or structure contributes to its meaning. What I mean when I say that is that it gives you an example of a sonnet here, which we're going to take notes on tomorrow, but also lyric poems that we've been talking about, narrative poems that tell a story, um, limericks, ballads, they all have different structures that build on its meaning. So and one of the things we've been learning about with lyric poetry is those strong emotional feelings that are there. And also it usually has a musical quality to it, which kind of gives it a sing-songy rhythm. Okay. Now, just to reiterate, poetry right here is writing that uses words, sound, and structure in special ways to express meaning. And then our very last sentence of this also tells us that poets may repeat certain words, sounds, words, or patterns to call attention to them or to create a rhythm. All right, so below, when I'm going to switch to my slide, we have a poem by William Butler Yeats. Keats and Yeats. Keats and Yeats. No. So, um, and in this one, it's going to even tell us that it describes the task a mother must do each day. And it wants us to actually pay attention to the rhyme scheme. And it even goes on to remind us what that means. Again, that's that last line, that last word of each line. And we're trying to see if it rhymes with other lines. Now, another thing we're also going to look for is um, the verbs. We're going to make sure we circle our groups of verbs. And at the end of each line, because that's another thing that's repeating in this particular poem. So one of the things that I've added out here on the side that I want you to pay attention to is this right here. Okay. 
So before we get going and we're breaking down our poem and we're looking at things, we want to make sure that we may we pay attention to who our poet is, who our speaker is, and the overall tone of the poem when we get done. So my first thing that we've got is we're going to box the title. And this is an excerpt from Song of the Old Mother by William Butler Yates. So my poet, I'm just going to come over here and write Yates on the side. I don't know my speaker yet because I haven't read it. And I want to make sure you realize that the poet isn't always the speaker. So, and then we want to number our lines and there are one, two, three, four, and there's no fifth line. So we've only got a four line poem that we're looking at. And this only has one stanza. Okay. Now, the next, our next step is always to go through and look to see if we have a rhyme scheme. We always want to look at our last word of each line. And I have blow, glow, sweep, and peep. Well, my very first one's going to get the letter A. And glow rhymes with blow, so it's also going to get a letter A. Sweep does not rhyme with anything above it, so it gets a new letter B. And peep rhymes with sweep, so it's also going to get a new letter. Well, same letter B. Now, the whole point of this, remember, is creating unity within our structure. So even if our stanza by itself has one whole meaning, each of these couplets, because that is what they are called, create building blocks for our overall poem to help us understand things. So we're going to go through it and we're going to read our poem, and then we will go back and talk about and see what repetition we can find and what each of these couplets means. From Song of the Old Mother by William Butler Yeats. 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 Yeah. By William Butler Yeats. I rise in the dawn and I kneel and blow till the seat of the fire flicker and glow. And then I must scrub and bake and sweep till stars are beginning to blink and peep. Okay, so I do notice that right here I've got some verbs. I have the kneel and blow. Right here I've got that bake and sweep. Also that fly, fire and glow and the blink and peep. So those verbs are there to emphasize what our speaker is doing. And by now, hopefully we realize the speaker is a mom. Simply, as simply put, it's just a mom. Now, I'm going to erase a couple of things so we can look and see what's going on. Okay. All right. So, now, when we look at our first two lines, that couplet, I rise in the dawn and I kneel and blow till the seed of the fire flicker and glow. Well, that is, if she's rising in the dawn, she's getting up in the morning. So, this is her morning. chores and then my last two lines and then I must scrub and bake and sweep till stars are beginning to blink and peep well this is also letting me know that her chores don't just stop in the morning they're her chores all the way until night okay so when I put this together as one giant block, this lets me know that I'm going to simplify this and just simply say moms do a lot of work. I could have even said moms do a lot of hard work. So that is the overall what it's trying to get at, that moms do a lot of work. Now, the other some a couple of other things I want to look at in the poem. And we also have some alliteration, just so you know, right there with that fire and flicker. Not sure if you caught that or not. And it's just to help tie that line together all the way down to glow. Now, our next thing that we're going to do is we're going to take what we do. Now, what's our overall tone of this? 
I don't want to just simply say it's positive, negative, or neutral. This is hard work and it sounds very tiring, which is kind of negative. So my tone for this is going to be a little bit on the negative and it makes it, and it makes everything just sound so very tired, right? Now, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to down and look at our chart, which goes over a few things that I'm going to add to. So we've got our rhyme scheme and we notice that our rhyme scheme is a... A, B, B, which gives us what is called couplets, All right? That means it's two lines back to back and it's built together to create, once again, those building blocks, that unity between those two lines and um, our, what it adds to the poem, how it builds on that structure. It ties together parts of each idea, starting the fire, all the way down to cleaning all day. So you end up with, once again, that A, A is in the morning. And that B, B is all day tonight. So that way you can see that uh, a mom's work is never done from the moment she gets up until she goes to bed. Well, then we get a repeated pattern. So there's that repetition that we were talking about. I know normally when we talk about repetition, previously we used alliteration and assonance and rhyme, internal and external rhyme. But now we're pulling into the patterns within the poem itself. And this is going over how these groups of verbs suggest the day in and day out nature of the woman's work. All right. So keep in mind that this is one of those things that we call classic literature that was written over a hundred years ago. So now it would be the song. If, if we were to rewrite this today, we might not necessarily call it the song of the old mother. We might call it the song of every good parent. So our poet's meaning though, from back when this was written is that the, the work of a mother is ongoing and difficult which goes back into what we just said that moms do a lot of work. Okay. Now down here at our bot, our bottom piece, it says that I'm going to just jump to where it says, we're looking to make sure that we understand a poem's meaning and how it's organized. We want to make sure we always ask those questions. Does it rhyme or is it in free verse? Remember free verse is not going to have a rhyme scheme. Not all poetry rhymes. All right. Remember, the rhyme is there built in to help aid ideas. Free verse isn't built that way. That it doesn't have to rhyme and it could just almost read the way it is. And they're going to use stanzas and lines to help make their ideas clear. Another question we always want to ask is, does the poet use repetition? And if so, what effect does it create? Now, when I say repetition, guys, hopefully we remember that I'm looking for not just repeating words, okay? I'm also looking for repeating parts of speech. I'm also looking for that, that fabulous Alliteration, assonance, and um, internal and external rhyme. Okay. All right. So we just always want to make sure that we ask the question, what effect does this create? And hopefully asking these questions will make it easier when you have to analyze your your poetry and when we're trying to break down a poem's overall meaning. If you have any questions, as always, please ask. We will be practicing this for the rest of the week. All right. Bye guys.